So serverless computing is a cloud computing model in which the cloud providers allocate machine resources on demand and take care of servers on behalf of the customers. So when we think about serverless, we generally think about services like Lambda if you're working in AWS or Function App if you're working in Azure or Cloud Functions if you're working in GCP. But that's not true. You can also include tools like SQS, SNS, if you're working in AWS or other application integration tools, if you're using the other cloud providers as well. So these gambit of services also come under serverless. And also so does the S3 bucket and all the other storage related capabilities that are provided by cloud providers. So serverless not only means compute like Lambda and functions, but it also includes integration tools and storages. So that's one thing you should keep in mind of when you're talking about serverless. So as long as the service allocates machine resources on demand and the servers are taken care of by the cloud providers themselves, then that particular service can be termed as serverless. Okay, so now that we know what serverless computing is, let's talk about a framework called serverless. Now these are two different terms altogether. Serverless computing is a very general term, whereas serverless framework is basically a tool which can be used for building applications that are centered around Lambda. Now Lambda, if you're using AWS, it could be something else if you're using some other cloud provider. For example, if you're using Azure, then it would be centered around app function. Or if you're using GCP, it would be centered around cloud functions, the GCP cloud functions. So there are two important concepts that I would like you to know before we proceed. The first concept is called as the function. Now this function is basically the code that you would be executing in Lambda. And then there is the event which would trigger that particular code. So these two form the foundation of the serverless framework. And you should always keep in mind that for every serverless framework, there would be function and then there would be an event to trigger that particular function. So you could consider serverless framework to be a specialized infrastructure as a code tool. Now, unlike other tools like Terraform or Ansible, or if you're using AWS, a tool like CloudFormation, the difference between those tools and the serverless framework is that you can use serverless framework just for creating Lambda-based serverless applications. You cannot use serverless frame framework for creating EC2 machines. It is specifically for building applications centered around Lambda. Now, if you glance through your right, you can see a set of events that can be used to trigger your Lambda function. Now, in AWS, there are quite a few substantial events that are available to you to trigger your Lambda function. So we will go one by one and check out the most important events that can be used to trigger your Lambda function. So now that we know what serverless is, now let's look at some of the disadvantages of using serverless. Now these disadvantages are only applicable for the compute services that are currently available. So this includes services like Lambda, App Functions, or the Cloud Functions that are available in GCP. So the most important disadvantage is performance. Then there are the resource limits, monitoring and debugging, and the vendor lock-in and security. Now I have marked them colored as red and yellow. Now the yellow ones are probably disadvantages that can probably be bettered later on. So monitoring and debugging tools currently are quite rudimentary in some of these services, but gradually they will get better. So now let's look at some of the more critical problems of using serverless. The most important problem is again, like I said before, performance. And this is related to a co concept called cold start. So now let's look at what cold start is. Now the most critical aspect of performance is a concept called cold start. So the cold start can be defined as the setup time that is required to get a serverless application up and running when it is invoked for the first time and within a definite period. Now cold starts are something of an inherent problem that is applicable across all cloud platform providers. This includes AWS, Azure, and GCP. So now based on a few parameters, your cold start can increase or decrease. So the increase in cold start would inherently mean an increase in latency and a decrease in performance of your application. Now the two most important factors are the code size and the language used. So the more the larger the code size of your application, the greater the 
cold start would be and the lesser the performance or the latency of your application will increase. Now similarly, another important factor to consider is what kind of language you are using, whether it's a compiled language or an interpreted language. So in the next slide, we will see the difference between using a compiled or an interpreted language. Now in AWS and Azure currently, there are ways to overcome cold start. AWS, AWS has a concept called provision concurrency. And in Azure, you can use a premium plan and above to overcome cold start. However, these are expensive ways to overcome cold start and it would cost you more and it would cost you more to use these services. So now let's look at what cold start is in a more diagrammatic way. So the cold start is basically the loading of your code as a zip file, then the creation of a container and then after that loading the runtime for your particular application to run. So these two combined together for, form the cold start. Now, as I said before, the larger your code size, the greater the cold start would be. And also another factor is whether you're using a compiled language or an interpreted language. So the compiled language would take more time to compile that particular code. Whereas if you're using an interpreted language, there is no concept of compilation of code. So that results in a lesser cold start if you're using an interpreted language. Underneath is a diagram to show you the difference between an interpreted language and a compiled language when it comes to the cold start execution time. So if you look at a code like Java, you can see that the cold start is around initially around 300 millisecond. Whereas if you're using a node based application, then it's around 3.5 to 3.75. Now there is a very good blog for this particular concept of cold start that I have linked in this particular slide. I will also mark this particular URL in the resources for this particular section. So please go through this and understand what the concept of cold start is. And this is a term that will come up across all platforms. And it is something that is not going to go away anytime soon. So now the other disadvantage of using a serverless application is that you have limited time and limited memory. That is because you wouldn't want your serverless application to be running forever. You would only want to run or execute small chunks of code for a limited period of time with a limited memory. Now, even though this is not a disadvantage, but this is something that you should be aware of. For example, at this moment, if you're using an AWS Lambda, your function cannot run for more than 15 minutes. Similarly, if you're using Azure, your function cannot run for more than 10 minutes. That is if you're using the consumption plan. These are different for the other plans, however. And similarly, if you're using GCP, the maximum that your code can run for is nine minutes. And the same is the case with the memory as well. The maximum memory that AWS allocates for a particular Lambda function is 10 GB. And for Azure, it's 1.5 and for GCP is 4 GB. Now these are limits that will keep changing. And if you look at this slide and if you see that the numbers are different, that's probably because those numbers have been changed. So I would imagine that these numbers would keep increasing. That is the time limit would keep increasing and so would the memory. So another disadvantage of using serverless is that you have lost control over your hardware and the runtime. And what eventually happens is that you end up using other proprietary cloud specific tools. They were making it difficult for you to move out of your of that particular ecosystem. So let's assume that you've created a Lambda application. Now you would want a trigger like an S3 bucket or an SQS or an SNS. So you would use that. You would also use other services like EC2, Aurora database, etc., etc., to make a complete application out of your particular Lambda. So once you have done that, you've basically created a application which uses proprietary cloud specific tools for AWS. And once you've done that, it's next to impossible for you to change from AWS to let's say you want to migrate to GCP or Azure. So this is something that you have to be aware of. You should be aware of the fact that once you are stuck in AWS, then you're stuck in AWS forever because of the fact that you would be using other proprietary, proprietary cloud specific tools along with your Lambda. So that's again, something of a disadvantage if you're using serverless. Okay, let me start by giving you a very basic definition of what Lambda is. Lambda is basically a compute service that lets you run small snippets of code without having the hassle of provisioning or managing servers. 
So now let's talk about some of the benefits of using Lambda. So the benefits of Lambda are the same benefits that you would get if you're using a serverless service. So this includes that there is no server to manage. There is continuous scaling. So as the number of requests keeps increasing, the Lambda scales automatically. So there is auto scaling automatically inbuilt into this. And then you only pay for what you use. So you're only paying for the compute time that is being used by your Lambda. So if your Lambda is idle, you do not need to pay for that particular moment in time. And then there is consistent performance at any scale. So as the number of requests keeps increasing, as continuous auto scaling happens, the performance does not degrade. So these are some of the benefits of using Lambda. So I'll see you in the next chapter where we'll discuss some of the important concepts of Lambda. So now before we proceed any further, I would like you to know three terms and they are the function, the event and the trigger. So a function is a resource that can invoke your code in Lambda. So that's a very straightforward definition, Lambda. Now to invoke your Lambda, you need to set a trigger for it. A trigger is basically a resource or a configuration that invokes a Lambda function. Now the most commonly used trigger is the API gateway. And this is basically the backbone of many backend serverless architectures that you will see. That is an HTTP request is sent to an API gateway, which acts as a trigger for the Lambda function. Other very commonly used triggers include the S3, the SNS, the SQS, etc. So these triggers are something that we will talk about as we proceed and as I show you more examples. Now, apart from the trigger and the function, there is the event. So the trigger will send an event to that particular function and it is basically a JSON formatted document. And this contains all the information that is needed for the function to execute properly. So that is it for this particular lecture. I will see you in the next lecture where I will show you a live demonstration of creating your first Lambda function. So I'll see you there. Okay, so I'm in my management console and I am currently in Ohio. So let us create a first Lambda. You could either search for Lambda here and you'll find it under services here, or you could just click on the services drop down here and under the compute section, you'll find Lambda. So let's open our Lambda function. So the first thing you can do is you can click on create function here. And here you get the option of either authoring from scratch using a blueprint, a container image, or browsing a serverless app repo. Let's choose the most basic and the simplest one currently. Let's just author it from scratch. And all that you need to give is just a name for your function. So I'll just call this as my function. And the runtime uh, and the runtime you can give is basically any one of these languages. So you have an option of .NET, Go, Java, Node, Python, or Ruby. You can also have custom runtime. So that's something that I will teach you in a later section. So for the time being, let's choose Node 14x. And then you need to create an execution role. Now an execution role is a very important concept in Lambda. And this is something that I'll teach you in the next section. So a basic preview of what an execution role is, it gives the Lambda permissions to access other AWS services. So what I'll do is I'll create a new role and give it basic Lambda permissions. So this Lambda permission is just to write logs into a log group. So I'll just click on this. And in the advanced section, you have two options. You have an option of code signing and network. So these are optional fields and these are something that we'll discuss in a later chapter. So let's just leave this as blank as it's optional. So let's click on create function. So my function has been created and currently there is no trigger attached to this particular function. So a trigger is something that we'll add in a later section. So you can run it directly without a trigger if you're in the console or you could use a CLI to do the same. So apart from this, let's keep going down. And here you can see the source code for this function. And this source code is very basic. It just returns the hello world back to the user. And here in this source code, you encounter the event. So this is basically a JSON formatted object. And this contains information that could be needed to run your Lambda. So let's create a first event. So to do that, you can just click on test here and it'll ask you to create an event. So our event is something like this. It has three key value pairs, key one, key two, key three. And the values are value one, value two, value three. You just need to give a name for your event. So I'll just call this as my event. I'll click on create here. And let's and let's test this particular function. So let's click on test here and it should return a res response back. And the response is just the body which says hello from Lambda. And this is basically the same hello from Lambda that you see in the code here. So this is extremely basic. There is no complexity in this whatsoever. And it just returns this response back to the user. So this is a simple way in which you can test your particular code within the console itself. Now, apart from that, you can also see here that the runtime is Node.js and the handler in, 
And the handler here is the index dot handler. So this handler is basically this particular function that is represented in the code here. And it is in the index.js file. Okay, apart from the lambda, this particular creation of a function also created another resource called as the role. Now, as mentioned earlier, the role gives permission to this lambda to access other AWS resources. Now, to check your particular role, you can go to your configuration. And here underneath permission, you can see the role that you have created. So this is the role that has been created. And what are the permissions that this particular lamb lambda gets? So the permissions are mentioned below. So it gives now these set of permissions allows now these set of permissions allows this particular lambda to create a log group and within that log group it allows the lambda to create a log stream and put events into that particular log stream now to view these particular logs you can go to your monitor here and you can click on view logs in cloudwatch and here you can see that the first permission it gave is to create a log group. So this is the log group that got created because of the role. And you can just open this particular log group. And then you can see a set of log streams that got created within this log group. And if you open any of these log streams, you can see a list of inserts that have happened. Now, these were only possible because of the role that we had created and because of the permissions that we had given to that particular role. Now, these logs can give you valuable information. So, for example, if I open one of these logs, I can see the duration for this particular function and the build duration as well as the memory use. So, this can also be used to console.log valuable information. So, if I go back to my function, what I've done is I've console.log the event and I've deployed the, this particular change. So, let's run this again and let's see what the latest log shows. So, I go back to my CloudWatch and I will just open the, the latest stream that got created. So this was the latest. So I'll just open this. And here, so here I can see the event in the particular logs. So this is basically the event that I had console.log in my index.js file. So this can come in handy if you want to debug your code. So that is it for this particular chapter. We'll discuss things more in details in the upcoming chapter. So I'll see you there. Okay, so now let's look at another very important configuration. So that is the memory and the timeout. So if you go to your configuration and if you click on your general configuration, now these two set of memory and timeout are very important. And if you click on edit, you can choose the amount of memory that you would want this particular Lambda function to have. The minimum is 128 and the maximum is 10 GB. So based on how complex your code is or how much computation power it requires, you can vary the number here. Also, another important factor to take keep into account is the timeout. So here the timeout default is three seconds. So that means if your function doesn't execute within three seconds, it will timeout and you will not get enough proper output. So here the maximum value that you can give your timeout is 15 minutes. So you have to make sure that your code executes within 15 minutes as the whole function will terminate. So these two are very important factors for you to know. So th these values are basically set based on what kind of code you write based on the complexity and based on how much time it takes for you to run that particular piece of code. So always remember to put the appropriate values here as there is a very high probability that your function might time out or run out of memory. So these two factors are something that you should always remember while you are creating your function. So I'll see you in the next chapter.
In this particular chapter, we'll talk about invocation of lambda function. Now, this might seem to be a very easy topic, and in fact it is, but it is equally a very important chapter. And I would say it's arguably the most important chapter in this course. A lot depends on how you invoke your lambda function and how your architecture would proceed based on that. So let us waste no more time and let's proceed to this particular section. So I'll see you there. So in this particular chapter, we'll talk about a very important concept called as version. So let's see what version is. So whenever you create your lambda, what you get created is a version that is mutable and this particular version is called as the dollar latest version and you can keep making changes to this particular version so if you want to add some code if you want to delete a piece of code or if you want to add a few more lines you could do that in your dollar latest version version now once you are sure that your function is absolutely perfect then the next thing that you would want to do is you want to publish that version so that it cannot be changed and it becomes immutable completely and not just the code but also the configuration and the environmental variables as well so let's see how this particular latest version that we've created can be converted into a immutable version so let's see how that is done so here i'm in my function once again so here the function that you see here is basically the dollar latest version and it is mutable because you can make changes to this so for example if you want to add a piece of code here you can do that as well so let, let's make some changes so let's add a few lines of text so i'll just add version one here and let's just deploy this as well okay so i've made all the changes i want to now make a version out of this dollar latest version and now to do that you can either go to this versions tab or you can just go up this particular screen click on actions and here you'll find a published new version now both of them have the same functionality so let's click on this particular button and here you just need to give a description for your version so i'll just call this as version one and i'll click on publish and here you can see that my version one has got created and this particular version so this is basically an integer that gets added every time a new version is created so if i make some more changes the next version that will be created will be two so now let's go and run this particular version so again let's click on code now, if I make some changes to this particular version one, you can see that I'm not able to do it because currently it has become immutable and no configuration and no settings can be changed for this particular version. So if I go to the configuration, you can see that everything is in a not editable mode. So now what we'll do is. So now if you want to make some changes, you have to again go to your dollar latest and make changes there and then create a new version out of that. So let's do that once more. So to go back to your dollar latest, you can just. Now, if you want to go back to your latest dollar latest again, you can click on my function here. And now you're back to your dollar latest version of this particular function. So this again is the editable version. So if you go down here again and let's make a few changes here as well. Now, what would happen if you want to make a version out of this? dollar latest now i have not made any changes to anything so let's try to make a version out of this so as you know i already have a version so if you click on versions here you can see that version one has been created so if you go back to your code and let's make a version not edit anything and let's not make any changes and let's see what happens if we make a version now so again let's go back to our action click on publish new version and let's just say call this as version two now, because I have not made any changes, let's see what happens if we try to publish this version. You can see that no changes were made to the dollar last since publishing version one. So no version was published. So because your dollar latest and your version one are basically the same and in sync, it doesn't allow you to create a new version. So let's create another version. So let's click on code again and let's just make this as two. And let's deploy this. And now you should be able to make a new version out of this. So you can just click on publish new version and let's just call this as version two. And let me publish this particular version now. And here you can see that I have created an, another version. So if you go back to your dollar latest version and if you click on the version tabs, you can see that currently I've created two versions that is version one and version two. And both of them have a different dis description. So that is how you can use versions to create immutable versions of that particular Lambda function. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next where we'll talk about aliases. So I'll see you there. So in this particular chapter, I will talk to you about the need for aliases. 
Now to do that, I will start by adding my fetch trigger to my particular function. So let's do that. So let's go back to my versions again. And let's click on the latest version. So this is my version two. And let's add a trigger to this version. And I'll add the most commonly used trigger. And that is the HTTP API gateway, which creates an HTTP endpoint for this particular function. So I will create a new one. I'll click on create an API and it will be just an HTTP API. Now let's not bother about the intricacies of this. All that it does is it just creates an HTTP endpoint for this particular function. So I click on add. So let's call this particular function too. So to do that, just click on this API gateway. What you get here is an API endpoint. So all that you need to do is you just need to copy this. And let's just paste this. And you can see that you get the output. Now let's suppose that this particular version has changed and you've created a version three for that, for this particular function. So let's do that. So I go back to my main function. And what I do is I'll create another version. So let's just create a version three. I'll click on action. I'll publish a new version. I'll just call this as version three. And I'll publish this. Okay, what I need to do is I need to deploy this. So I click on deploy. Click on actions and publish new version. Again, I'll just call this as version three. Click on publish. Okay, so now the issue is that if I have to access my version three, I have to create another trigger and I have to update the front end or the piece of code that is calling this particular version so that it is able to access the latest version of this particular Lambda. Now that is an issue because the problem there is that for any new version that gets created, you need to create a new trigger and you need to update the front end for the same. Now to overcome that particular problem, we have something called as an alias. Now let's see how that works. So I go back to my function again. What I'll do is I click on an alias and I'll create an alias. So I'll just call this as my alias. So you can just give a name for my alias, for your alias. The description is optional. And here you can give a version. So let's just choose the third version. So now what will happen is that I have created an alias and that alias will point to whatever version of that particular Lambda that you like. So I'll click on save. And you have created an alias and this particular alias is pointing to the latest version. And here the important thing is you can add a trigger and this trigger can again be an API gateway. So let's create a new trigger. So let's create an API. Again, this will be an open one. I'll click on add. So now this particular API endpoint, HTTP endpoint that I have created can point to whatever version that you like. So currently, if I open this particular endpoint, you can see it's pointing to version three. Now I can change this manually as well. So if I go back to my alias again, so I'll click on my edit. And here, if I want this particular endpoint to point to version two, I just Change this to version two and click on save. And if I click on the same endpoint again, now you can see that it's pointing to version two. And another very distinct advantage that this has is that you can have it as a weighted alias as well. So let's say I want half of my versions to be pointing to version three and the other half is pointing to version two. So I will just change the weight to 50 here and 50 here. So half the request will go to version two and the other half will go to version three and I'll click on save. So if I go back to my endpoint and if I do a control F5, you can see that some of the endpoints are going to version two and the others are going to version three. So now if I want to configure my front end, I just need to give this HTTP endpoint rather than giving new HTTP endpoint for endpoints for new versions. So I hope this was a useful lecture and if you have any doubts about this, please get in touch with me and I'll 
that will help you out. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, so in this particular section, I'll describe to you how you can upload your code as a zip file. So I have my Visual Code Studio editor. So the first thing I'll do is I will initialize a node project. To do that, I'll go to my terminal. And I'll just do an NPM in it. Yes. And let me create an index.js file here. So I'll create a new index.js file. And in this index.js file will be my handler. So let me copy your handler that I had already written previously. So this is just a very basic handler and it just returns a hello world or hello from Lambda back to the user. Okay, so now that I've created a very basic sample project, let's add a few libraries to our project as well. So what I'll do is I'll add a moment.js library. So what moment.js does is that it just returns your date in a particular format, in any particular format that you want. So for example, if you have a format like this, it'll display your date like this. Or if you have a format like this, then it'll just display this particular value. So this is basically done for formatting purposes. So this is the library that we will add to our particular package. So for this, what I need to do is I just need to go back to my particular console and I will just do an npm install And if I go back to my package.json file, you can see that dependency has gotten has been added. So the next thing I'll do is I'll go to go back to my index.js and I will call that particular library. So I'll do a variable moment require. And let's see a sample code. So I will just copy this particular sample code. I'll go back to my, and here what I'll do is instead of returning hello from Lambda, I will just return that particular information. So this is about it. So we've created a code. So we've just added one particular dependency to our package.json file. And now we need to zip this particular file. So let's do that. So I go back to my folder again. So I'll just copy all of them and I will send this to a zip folder. And I let it be called package. And now I need to go to my console and just upload this particular zip folder. So let's do that. So here I'll create a new function again. Again, it'll be from scratch. I'll click on create function. And now what I need to do is I need to upload from zip file. And let's just upload that particular zip file that we've created. So it's an example too. I'll upload this particular file and I'll click on save. And now if you look at the source code, you can see that there is a node module and this node module contains my library that I have uploaded. So this is the moment library. And then there is the index.js and the package.json file. So let's test this particular. So I need to create a new event. So I'll just call this as my event. Click on create. And let's test this particular function now. And you can see that there is a date here. So this was because of the moment library that we had uploaded. So that is it for this particular lecture. I will see you in the next lecture where we'll do the same, but not using a zip folder, but using an S3 bucket. So I'll see you there. Okay, so in this particular section, we will upload the same piece of code, but using S3. So for that, the first thing we'll do is we'll create an S3 bucket. So let's go to our S3. Let me create a new bucket. So I'll click on create bucket.
and I'll click on create bucket. Once I've done that, the next thing I need to do is I just need to upload that particular folder, the zip folder that I had previously created. So let's do that. So I go to my bucket that I have just created. I will just click on upload here. Or should I say add files because it's a zip file. I'll just upload this package log zip folder. So if your code, if your zip folder is more than 50 MB, then you have to mandatorily upload it into an S3 bucket before you can upload it into your function. So that is one thing you should remember. So let's open this and let's wait for this to be uploaded. Click on upload. Okay, once you've uploaded it, let's go back to our functions again. I'll create a new function again from scratch. Click on create function again. And here the only difference is I will upload it from an S3 location. So here I need to give the path for that particular S3. So let's get that path as well. So S3, open this in a new link. So I can just copy this S3 URI. I'll just copy this. Click on save. And again, you can see that it has uploaded the code that we need. So let's click on test again, create a new event. Click on create and click on test. So you see that you get the same output. Okay, so for larger uploads, you should always consider using S3 rather than directly uploading it as a zip file. So I'll see you in the next lecture where we'll talk about layers and the need for layers. So I'll see you there.
Okay, in our previous two examples, we had created functions and these functions have basically a node library within it. And this node library has the moment module within it. So you can see that both these functions have the same modules within it. So wouldn't it be cool if we have a repository in which we could store these libraries and we could just access them directly rather than having to upload them again and again. So that's where layers come into the picture. So you can create a library within your layer and you can then create a Lambda and that Lambda can directly access the library from there rather than having to upload it again and again. So let's create a layer first. So to do that, you can go to your functions and you can click on layers here and then you can click on create layer. So before we create a layer, let's get our moment library and zip it and then we can create a layer and upload it. So let's go back to our folder here. So the first thing I need to do is I just need to zip this particular folder. So I have zipped this folder and now the only thing I need to do is I just need to upload this in my layers. So I go back to my console, I create a layer here. I'll just call this as moment. And let me click on upload here. And I'll just upload this particular file and click on open. And then you need to mention for which particular runtime it is. So I will just choose, choose node 14 and node 12. And let's click on create here. So we've created our layer. So the next thing we need to do is we need to create another Lambda function. So I'll click on create function here. But before we do that, let's just copy the same code that we already have. So I go back to my previous code, click on index.js and I'll just copy this. Click on functions again. Let me create a new function. I'll click on create. And now let me just paste that same piece of code. And here the only difference is that this particular moment library is basically within the OPT folder. So I need to give the path for the OPT folder. And it's in within this particular path that my library will be stored. So I will just save this. And that's the only change that I need to make. So currently I have not uploaded any particular library in my folder. So this particular moment library will be accessed from this particular path. So the only thing I need to do after this is I just need to go down and add that particular layer that I had created. So I'll click on custom layer here and I'll choose the later layer that I had just created. And it will be version one. And I'll click on add. And once I do this, my particular library will be within this particular path. So that's the only change I need to do. Let me just deploy this. And let's test this particular thing. So let's create an event again. I'll just call this as my event. I'll click on create. And let's test this now. So you can see that I was able to get a response and now this particular library is in this particular path. So that was the reason why this particular piece of code worked. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I'll see you in the next lecture. In this particular chapter, we'll talk about invocation of Lambda function. Now this might seem to be a very easy topic and in fact it is, but it is equally a very important chapter. And I would say it's arguably the most important chapter in this course. A lot depends on how you invoke your Lambda function and how your architecture would proceed based on that. So let us waste no more time and let's proceed to this particular section. So I'll see you there. So now let's start this section by talking about synchronous invocation. Now in synchronous invocation, the client or the service sends an event to that Lambda function the Lambda function processes that event, completes its computation and sends a response back to the client or the service. A very common example of this is the API gateway. So in this API gateway, a request is sent to that Lambda. The Lambda processes the request and sends a response after the processing back to the API gateway. And the API gateway sends it back to the user. So this is the most common example that you will encounter, that of the API gateway sending a synchronous invocation to the Lambda. Now there are other services 
through which you can have synchronous invocation as well. Now these include services like Elastic Load Balancing, Cognito Connect Lex, API Gateway, Secret Manager and a few more. Now the most important services here are the Load Balancer and the API Gateway. So in these services, you expect a response back from the Lambda after the processing has been done in that Lambda. So, so now let me show you a few examples of this. So I'm back in my console and I've just opened one of the functions that I have previously created. So the first place where you will encounter a synchronous invocation is in the console itself. So whenever you click on test and when you invoke this particular piece of code, it returns a response back. And this response is basically after the computation of this particular Lambda is done. So if I click on test here, you can see that it returns the response, which is basically the output of this particular Lambda. And similarly, let's also create an API gateway. So I click on add trigger. I click on an API gateway. So this is something that we had previously done as well. So I'll click on HTTP API. And let's just make this as an open endpoint and click on add. And let's open this particular endpoint as well. So all that I need to do is I just need to call this particular endpoint. And you can see that it returns a response. And this response is basically the output of that particular Lambda after it has finished its computation. Now there's another way in which you can invoke your Lambda and that is using your AWS CLI. So to do that, you can open your Cloud Shell. And once you've opened your Cloud Shell, you can actually run an AWS Lambda command to trigger this particular Lambda in a synchronous manner. So, so this is the command to do that. So all that you need to give is basically the name of the function the payload, this is basically the event. And if you're using the latest version of your CLI, you also need to give this particular line. So this particular command, I will paste in the description below. So you can just copy this. So let's copy this and let's just paste it in our console as well. So I'll just copy this and let me just paste it here. And you get a response that looks like this. Basically, this gives a status of 200 and an execution ver version saying, this is basically the version that we've executed. So it also creates a, json file and this particular json file has the response of that particular lambda so if i open this it would print the output that you expect so that is basically the date as well as the status code of 200 so this is basically how you can invoke your lambda synchronously so in our next chapter i will discuss what asynchronous invocation is and how you can invoke the same lambda in an in, in a asynchronous manner. So I will see you there. So now let's talk about asynchronous invocation. In asynchronous invocation, the client or the service does not call the Lambda function directly, but it sends a message to the event queue. And that it is this particular event queue which has the responsibility of sending the event to that Lambda function. Now a very common use case of this is basically an S3 trigger. So whenever an S3 trigger is sent to a Lambda function, it actually sends the event not directly to the Lambda, but to an event queue. And it is that event queue which sends it to that Lambda. So you would use an asynchronous invocation when you're not worried about the response of that particular Lambda function. You just want to send that particular event to that Lambda and you're not worried about the response of that particular Lambda. So some of the services that are used for asynchronous invocation includes the Amazon S3, the SNS, the SES, that is a simple email notification, uh, AWS Cloud Formation, and a few more. Okay, so now let's look at a few examples of this. So I will see you in the console in the next chapter. Okay, so we are back in our old function again. So let's try to run this particular function asynchronously. Now there are a few ways to do it. You can either add a asynchronous trigger to this, like an S3 bucket or something like that, or you could even call it via the CLI. Unfortunately, you cannot call this particular function asynchronously via the console itself. So the first thing we'll do is we'll try to call this asynchronously via the CLI. So let's open the cloud shell again. So to run your function asynchronously, you just need to add one extra parameter. You just need to add the invocation type as event. So everything else is the same. So I'll just copy this and I'll paste it. Now what will happen is when I run this particular command, it will just give me a 202 response back and immediately I will get that response. So if you want to see what has happened in that function, you need to check the logs. So I'll just run this and you'll get a 202 response. It also creates a response.json file, but this response.json file will be empty. So if I just try to open this, you can see that there's nothing inside this. 
So let's try to see the logs and let's see if it has actually triggered this particular Lambda function. So I go back to my console and if I click on monitor, I click on view logs in CloudWatch. And you can see that this particular event was triggered uh, exactly at 7.15, uh, at uh, 5.16. So if I open this, you can see that there was nothing. So it has actually run properly without any error. So this is how you can run your function asynchronously. So the only thing if you want to run it by the CLI is you just need to give one extra parameter. So now let's try to run this in another way. So let's try to add a trigger. So I cleared, create a S3 trigger for this. Now I showed you the list in my previous slide. So that list contains a series of services that you can use. So let's try the most commonly used one that is the S3 storage. So I'll just open the S3 storage and I need to select a bucket. So this bucket has to be within the same location as my function. So my function is in Ohio and my new VLC code bucket is also within Ohio. So I'll just open this. And here I need to mention the event type. So the event type could be any one of these following. So I'll just choose the all object create event and the rest can be left as empty. So I just click on I acknowledge and I click on add and my trigger has been successfully created now. So what I'll do next is I'll go to this particular S3 bucket and upload this particular and upload a particular file and let's see what happens. But before I do that, let me go to my code once. And what I'll do is I'll just console.log the event. So and I'll deploy this. Let's go back to a bucket. And what I'll do now is I will just add an object to this particular bucket. So I click on upload, add a file. I just had a CSS file and I'll click on upload. So now let's go back to our function and let's see what has happened. So I'll go to my monitor again, click on view logs in CloudWatch. And you can see that a trigger has happened. So let's open this particular trigger. And if I open this now, you can see that the event has certain values. So these are the values that you can get in the event. So you can get the name of the S3. So it's stored as an object here and you can get the event type. So you can get the event source, which was an S3, and you can get the object created port, which was the event name. So that is how you can asynchronously trigger a particular Lambda function. So that's it for this particular chapter. I'll see you in the next chapter. So whenever you trigger an asynchronous invocation, the service or the client which invokes the Lambda has absolutely no idea whether that particular Lambda has failed or passed. So if in case that Lambda has failed for some reason and you want to retry it, that particular client or service cannot do it directly. So that is where the event queue comes in handy. So the event queue has the potential to retry your particular Lambda whether when it has failed. And it also has the potential to send that particular error if it has failed to an SQS or an SNS event. So let's see how this works. Here I have created a new function and this particular function has an error in its code. So as you can see that the variable here is not defined and I've already deployed this code. Now, if I want this particular piece of code to be retried, what I need to do is I need to go to my configuration. I need to go to my asynchronous invocation. And here, if you click on this retry attempt, so if you click on edit here, you can see that this particular function, if it is invoked asynchronously, will retry twice. And another important thing to note is that this particular event would be in the event queue for six hours. So these two things can be controlled by you itself. Now let's run this particular function and let's see whether it actually retries this particular function. So I go back to my console again. So I will just copy this function. And so I will invoke it through the CLI. So the only thing I need to change here is basically the name of this function. And there is also a payload. Now this payload is basically not relevant here because the code is going to fail anyway. So what I'll just do is I'll just copy this and I'll paste it here. So and let's run this. 
So again, you can see that it just returns a 202. So whatever happens, whether your function fails or passes, it doesn't matter, it'll return a 202. So what I need to do now is I need to check the logs for this particular function, and I need to check whether this particular log has a retry attempt for it. So I will go back to my monitor. I'll click on view logs in CloudWatch. I'll open this. So it has actually failed for the first time. And if I keep waiting, I should also see two more retries. So let's wait for this and let's see whether it actually retries it twice. And here you can see that that particular function ran twice more. So here was the first attempt. And after the first attempt, it ran, it ran after one minute here. And again, it ran after one minute here. So in our next chapter, I will show you a real use case where this retry mechanism can come in handy. So I'll see you there. Okay, so now let's look at a more genuine example of how you can configure your retry mechanism. So in this particular example, I have an async trigger that will trigger a lambda function asynchronously. So I will configure the lambda in such a way that initially this particular lambda will fail and on retrying it will succeed again. And when this particular lambda fails, it will be subscribed to an SNS queue and this SNS queue will be subscribed to an email ID and the particular email ID will receive the mail whenever the lambda fails. So let's look at this particular example. Okay, here I've created a lambda function and this lambda function, all that it does is it calls this particular endpoint and whatever response it gets, it returns it back to the user. So let me click on this test and let's see how this works. If I run this synchronously, I click on test here and it returns a response back. And the other thing that I would want you to show is I'll go to my configuration and in this particular asynchronous invocation, I have added a dead letter queue and this dead letter queue is calling a topic and this topic is currently subscribed to a email ID. So let me show you that as well. So I'll go to my SNS. So I've created a topic called my topic. And if I open this topic, you can see that there is one subscription and this subscription is just an email ID subscription to this particular email ID. So whenever a message is sent to that topic, that topic will send a message to this particular email ID. So it's a very simple configuration. There's no complexity in this at all. So I'll cancel this. So how I will make this work is very simple. So initially I will throttle this particular endpoint so that this particular Lambda fails. And after it has failed for the first time, I will disable the throttle and the next time it should pass. So let's do that. So I'll go back to my Lambda that is connected to this particular API gateway. And that is this particular Lambda function. I'll open this. You can see that it's connected to the same API gateway. So the first thing I'll do is I will use this particular button to throttle. So I'll click on throttle here. I'll click on confirm. So now let's go back to our previous function. Now, if I run this synchronously, let's see what happens now. You can see that it returns an error saying that uh, the request failed with status code 503. Now that's because I have throttled that particular Lambda. So now what we'll do is I will go to my CLI and I will invoke this function asynchronously. So let's run this particular Lambda asynchronously. I'll copy this. I'll paste it here. And now let's look at the response. So I'm going back to my cloud shell again. So let's look at the latest stream. So this is the latest stream at 23.17. And you can see that initially it has failed. Let's click on resume again. And it's failed for the second time as well. So I'll go back to my first function and I will remove this throttle. I'll click on edit concurrency. I will go back to my unreserved and I click on save. Now the third time it should actually pass. So let's check the logs once more. And it's running for the third time. And you can see that the third time there was no error like the previous two times. So that means that this particular Lambda ran properly on the third time. So this is how you can use your retry mechanism. 
And also, if I check my email ID, you can see that I got a notification for all the times that my particular function failed. However, it just returned me the payload for that particular event. So this is how you can use your retry mechanism. It really comes in handy whenever your third party API fails and you want to make sure that if it comes back up again, there is a retry mechanism to make the whole Lambda work again. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so now let's talk about the concept of destination. Whenever an asynchronous trigger triggers a Lambda function, the response of that Lambda function is not returned back to the trigger. However, using destination, you have the option of sending the response of that particular Lambda to the following. You can either send it to an SNS, an SQS, or a Lambda function. So let's implement this practically. So what I will do is I will have a Lambda that I've already created and the response of this particular Lambda, I will send it to an S SNS and that SNS will be subscribed by an email ID and that email ID should get the response of that particular Lambda. So let's see how this works. So I have my Lambda function here that returns back the date. So this is the basic function that we had previously created. So there's nothing special in this. So what we'll do is we'll add a destination to this. So to do that, you can click on add destination and on an asynchronous invocation, a uh, stream invocation is something that we will see later on. So for asynchronous invocation on success, I will send this destination to an SNS topic and I've already created an SNS topic that I had previously shown you. So all that you need to do now is just save this. And if I run this using the API gateway, it will not trigger this destination. That is because the API gateway is a synchronous invocation. And similarly, if I run this using my console over here, then too it would not work. So to make this work, I have to run this asynchronously. And I, of course, I'll use the CLI to do it. So I'll just change my function name. I'll just paste this new. And let me just copy this and paste it here. Okay, so I have sent a asynchronous invocation to this particular Lambda. So let's check my email ID to see whether I've received any message. I go back to my, and you can see that I have received a message stating that my Lambda was successful. So this is how you can use your destination. You can also use this destination to invoke another Lambda, and that is a use case that can come in handy. And that is something that I might show you in a later course. So I will see you in the next chapter. So now let's talk about event source mapping. So there are certain services like queues and streams which do not invoke the Lambda directly. Now let's take an example of a queue. If you are a consumer of the queue, it is you as a consumer which keeps scrolling for the queue and seeing if there are any new messages. Similarly, if you have a Lambda that is connected with the queue, it is not the queue that will send a message directly to the Lambda. However, it is the Lambda that keeps scrolling for the queue and checks whether there are any new messages that is available. So to do that, what it uses is an event source mapping. And it is this event source mapping that connects the queue to this particular Lambda. And the Lambda will keep polling for the event source mapping. And if there are any new messages in the event source mapping, then that Lambda will invoke that particular Lambda function that will that will process the items in the queue. Unlike the asynchronous and the synchronous invocation, where it was actually the source or the service that was actually invoking the Lambda, this is the other way around. So this is basically a Lambda that is invoking the event source mapping to check if there are any new messages within it. So in this particular example, the event source mapping can read the data from the queue and it can store it as a source batch. So it can store multiple items within the same batch. And once this batch is stored in the event source mapping, the Lambda function can read that same data as an event batch and it can process it. So that is how the event source mapping works. So so some of the services with which you can actually use the event source mapping includes the DynamoDB, the Kinesis, the Message Queue, and primarily the Amazon Simple Queue services. So any service that is primarily a queue or a stream can be read through an event source mapping. So let's look at an example in our next chapter where we will create a queue and we will connect it to a Lambda. So I'll see you there. Okay, let's start by creating a queue. So to create your queue, you can just type SQS here and you will just need to click this particular icon or you would go to the services here and do the same as well. So SQS would be 
under your application integration. So you'll find SQS over here. So once you've opened your SQS, the first thing I'll do is I'll just create a queue. So I'll click on create queue. I'll make this as a standard queue. So there is there are two kinds of queues. There's the standard and the P4. So you can just go through the documentation to see the difference between both of them. And the only thing I need to do is I just need to give a name for my queue. I'll just call this as my queue. And everything I will leave as it is. And I'll click on create queue. Okay, once I've created the queue, I'll go back to my Lambda. I'll create a function as well. So I'll click on create function. Again, it will be author from scratch. I'll call this as my queue function. I'll click on create function. Once I've created my function, I can click on add trigger. And I need to set it SQS from the drop down. So I click on SQS. And here I just need to give the name of my queue. So it comes in the drop down. So you don't need to do anything much. And here there is the batch size and then there is the batch window. So the batch size is basically how many number of messages you want to retrieve in a single batch. So here you can define the number of messages that you can retrieve. So here the default is 10 and you can keep increasing or decreasing it based on how much you want. And here another important attribute is the batch window. So this is basically the maximum amount of time to gather records before invoking the function. So if you keep increasing this value, there is a possibility that you might get more messages because there is a longer wait before the function is invoked. So you can choose these values based on the application that you create. And then you need to click on enable trigger to make the event mapping work. And I will click on add. And here it throws an error. So the error that it throws is that the provided execution role does not have permissions to call the SQS. So what we need to do is the applic the role, the execution role for this particular function doesn't have access to XQ SQS. So let's add that as well. So this is a very common use case you will encounter while you're integrating new services with Lambda. So you need to give permissions so that the Lambda is able to access it. So again, I need to go back to my configuration. I will go to my permission. And this is the role to which I need to give access to the SQS. So I will click on this particular role. And what I will do is I will attach policy. So I will attach a AWS managed policy for SQS. So I will just search for SQS. So this particular policy will give access to all the functionality within SQS. So I will just select this. I will click on attach policy. OK, now my the role will have that policy attached as well. And you can see that it has the SQS full access policy. So now let's go back to our queue and let's complete that task that we previously were not able to because of the role. So I, again, I'll go back to my SQS, click on SQS. Again, I'll just call the my queue that I just created. The batch size is 10, the batch window is zero. And let's see what happens if I click on add now. And this time it worked. <clears throat> so the next thing I'll do is I'll send a message via SQS. I'll go back to my SQS terminal. So before I send and receive message, so before I send a message to this particular queue, let me show you the Lambda trigger. So you can see that there is a new entry that is and added to this particular Lambda trigger. So this particular entry was added when I created the trigger via my Lambda. So that's how this thing got automatically enabled. So the next thing I need to do is I'll go back to my Lambda again. Let's click on code. Let's just console.log the event and let's see what information it has. So I will just do a console.log. I'll just type in the event and I'll deploy this change. I'll go back to my SQS again and let's send a message. So I will just call this as hello world. And let's send this particular message. Your message has been sent and it is ready to be received. So I'll go back to my Lambda again. Let's see the logs and let's see what we get. So I'll go back, go back to my monitor. View logs in CloudWatch. So you can see a new entry. So if I open this, 
And if I look at the console.log, you can see that the body here is basically the message that was sent via the queue. And one more thing to note is that since this particular function executed successfully, the message from the queue got automatically deleted. So if you go back to your queue again, and if you click on send and receive message, and if you poll for the same message, you'll see that there is nothing. So one thing that you should always remember is that if your Lambda doesn't execute properly, or if it gives an error, then the message will be sent back to the SQS queue. So that is it for this particular lecture. I will see you in the next.
So now let's talk about connecting your Lambda to a VPC. Now a VPC is a network that has certain resources that you own within it. So a VPC is basically a network that is exclusively owned by you. And all the resources within it are also basically something that you own. Now a Lambda is in a environment or in a network that is owned by AWS itself and you have absolutely no control over the environment there. Now to connect your Lambda to your VPC, you have to make a few changes to your settings. So in this particular section, we'll talk about how you can connect your Lambda to an EC2 machine via the private IP address of the EC2 machine. So let's see how we can do this. So the first thing that I have done is I have created an EC2 machine and this EC2 machine is basically a very simple T2 micro and it's in the default network. So the first thing I'll do is I'll open this particular EC2 machine. So to do that, I can just click on connect and I will just connect using the EC2 instance connect. I just click on connect here. So once I'm connected to the machine, what I need to do is I need to run a node application. So that's precisely what I have done. I have created a app.js and this app.js uses the express framework to return a API back to the user. So let me show you the application. So it's a very simple application. It just returns a hello world back to the user. So if I run this particular IP address, you can see that it returns a hello world. So currently I'm using the public IP address to access this particular endpoint. So we have our EC2 machine and we have a API running on this. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to create a Lambda function so that we are able to connect to this particular IP address. We'll do it first using the public IP address and then we'll do it using the private IP address. So let's start by creating a Lambda. So I'm in my functions right now. I click on create function. Again, it's going to be author from scratch. I just call this as my VPC network. I'll click on create. And here what I'll do is I'll update my piece of code use in the console itself. So what I'll do is I'll just call the Axios library and this Axios library makes it simple for me to do a get request. So what I need to do is I just need to do a get request on this particular IP address. So this is the private IP. Let me just copy this public IP from here and I'll paste it here. So all that this particular function will do is it will just get the data from this particular IP address. It's running on port 3000 and then the response it will just return it back to me. So let's deploy this function and let's see what happens. This particular code I will give in the description below. And if you have any issues with this particular code, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me and I'll gladly help you out. So let's test this particular application. Okay, let's create an event. I'll click on create now. And let's test this application. Okay, I need to add the layer as well. So I will click on layers here, add a layer, custom layer, Axios. And let's run it again. And you can see that it returns a hello world back to me. So the next thing that I'll do is, okay, I know that this particular IP works and let's try to access it just using the private IP of this particular instance. So I go back to my VPC again. I'll click on the instance. So here we get the private IP of this particular instance. So I will just copy this private IP address and I will paste it over here. And let's deploy this. Now, at this moment in time, my function here is not connected to the VPC. So this thing should fail. So let's click on test again. And you can see that is it timed out. That's, so that is because my function here does not have any access to the VPC. So let's give this particular function access to the VPC. So I will go to my configuration again. And I will click on the VPC here. I'll click on edit. 
And here I need to choose the VPC. So I only have one default VPC. So it's within this default VPC that my virtual machine resides. So I will have to give an access to a particular subnet. So you can have the option of giving access to all the subnets. That's precisely what I'll give. I will give access to all the subnets here. So the more you give, the better the availability would be. So you also need to give a security group. So what I'll do is I will just give the security, the default security group. And the default security group has basically all protocol, all ports. So this should suffice. And I click on save here. Okay, now there is an issue. It says that the ex uh, the role does not have permission to create a NIC. So what will happen is when I click on save, a network interface will be connected to this particular Lambda. So to do that, I need to give access to the role to make sure that it has access to create a network interface. So again, we need to go back to our permissions and give this particular Lambda's execution role permissions to create a network interface. So I'll cancel this. I will go back to my permission here. I'll open this role. And I'll attach a AWS managed policy. I'll click on attach policy. So the permission to create a network interface interfaces within the EC2 policy. So let's give this particular Lambda uh, Amazon EC2 full access. So there would be permission within this policy to create a network interface. So I click on attach. Let's go back to our configuration. So let's create the VPC again. I click on edit. And we'll do the same step again. I click on VPC. I'll choose all the subnets. And the default VPC security group. And I'll click on save. So now you can see that that error goes. So let's wait for this particular function to be to be updated. So basically, what would so what would actually happen is that this particular lambda would be connected to a network interface that is within this particular VPC, and that would give this lambda access to this VPC. So it's a little more complex than that. I, I will give you a link to a YouTube video in the description below. So that would be of much use to you. So let's go back to our console again. And let's wait for this to finish. OK, so it has successfully updated. So let's go back to our code again. And let's run this code once more. So again, this is the private IP address. And let's click on test. And you can see that I get a response back. Now, that is because this particular Lambda currently is connected to our default VPC. So that was why this particular VPC. So that was why this particular Lambda was able to connect to my virtual machine using just the private IP address. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. So in this particular section, we'll talk about creating a custom runtime. So the first custom runtime that we will create would be for a shell script. And then in my second chapter, I will create a custom runtime for Perl. So let's start by creating the first custom runtime. So you can click on create custom function here. You can give a name for your function. So I just call this as my shell runtime. And then under the runtime, you can click on the drop down. And then you need to choose the use default boots, bootstrap on Amazon Linux one. So I'll click on this and I'll click on create function. And it has created a custom runtime for a shell script. So let's look at the code. And here in this code, you can see that there are two files that gets created, the bootstrap and the hello.sh file. So the hello.sh file is the shell script that we want to run. And all that it does is it just returns the status code 200 and hello from Lambda. So how do you run this particular handler, which is written in the shell script? To do that, you need to use the bootstrap. So let's open the bootstrap. So the bootstrap is basically the start point of this particular Lambda. And what it does initially is that it sources the hello.sh file. And after it does that, it keeps running in a loop and it waits for events from the user. And for each event using the Lambda Runtime API, it's able to extract the header, the event data, and the invocation ID. 
And after that, what it does is it runs the handler function within this hello.sh file. So if I open this hello.sh file, there is a function called handler. And if I open the bootstrap again, what it does is this particular line will run the handler file. And this particular handler file will use the event data which it gets from this particular variable. And after that, it just uses the curl command to send the response back to the user. And that's it. So this keeps running in a loop waiting for events from a user. So let's test this particular application and click on test. So let's configure a test event. So I click on this, I click on configure test event. And it's just the key one, key two keys. I'll save this. And after that, let me click on test. And here it returns the hello from Lambda. So let's make a few changes to this. I click on hello.sh. And let's also display, let's just display the event data instead of this. So I'll just copy this event data. And let's deploy this. So what should be sent back to the user should be the event data. So I'll click on test now. You can see that I get the response, the event data back from the hello.sh. So this is how you can run your shell scripts using custom runtime. So in our next chapter, I'll be using the same bootstrap. And instead of running a hello.sh, what I'll be running is a Perl script. So let's see how we can do that. So I'll see you there. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to download, compile, and install Perl. So we'll be doing it in an EC2 machine. And once we've done that, and once we've created the binary, we'll be copying that binary to a Lambda layer. So, so this is the website that I'll be using. This particular website I'll share in the description below. So all that I need to do is I need to create an instance in EC2 and then run these set of commands. So let's do that. So I'll just copy these. And let's run these commands one by one. These commands I will also link in the description below so you can have a look at that as well. Okay, so once you've run all these commands, you can go back to your home directory and within your home directory, there'll be a folder called local Perl and within that local Perl will be a binary. So what you need to do is you need the binary and the library file so you can remove the MAN folder because it's not needed. So let's do that. And the next thing I need to do is I need to zip these two files and make a layer out of it. So to do that, let's first zip this particular file. So what I'll do is I will create a zip folder. And I'll put the bin and the library folder within it. Okay, so you can see my zip folder is created. Now, all I need to do is I need to create a layer out of this. So let's do that. So let's get the command to create a layer. So this is the command that I'll use. I will just call this as Perl layer. And the zip would be basically the Perl.zip that I have. So yeah, so this is the copy. So I just copy this particular command and this should hopefully create a layer called Perl hyphen layer and I'll be using this to run my particular application. So let's just copy this and create a layer. So I go back to my console again. So let's run this. Okay, so it's Perl one dot zip. And I've created a layer. So let's go. So let's go back to a Lambda function in our console and let's see whether it's been created. And you can see that a layer has been created called Perl layer. I have not mentioned the runtime. You can actually do that in the command itself. Unfortunately, I forgot to mention that. So you can mention the so you can mention the runtime in the command as well. So so the description or the documentation for the command I will give you in the description below. So you can you can use that to also mention the runtime. So okay, so we have created a layer. Now the next thing that we'll do is we'll create a function and we'll use that particular function with this layer to run a Perl application. So let's do that. I go back to my lambda again. Okay, so now that we've created a layer, the next thing that we'll do is we'll create a function and I'll use the same custom runtime that I had previously used. So I'll just call this as my Perl app. And here again, I will just choose the same default bootstrap. I'll click on create function. 
Okay, okay, so we've created a function. The first thing that we need to do is we need to add the layer. So I'll click on add layer. And here you need to specify an ERN because I have not mentioned any runtime. So I will not see anything if I click on custom layers here. So let's get the ERN for that particular layer. I go back to my Lambda again, click on layers. And I just need to copy this. I'll just copy this. Go back to my layers again. I'll click on add a layer. Specify an ERN and I'll just paste and click on add. Okay, once we've done that, let's go back to our code. Okay, so you can see that I have the bootstrap and the hello.sh. So I don't need the hello.sh because I'll be creating a Perl file. So I'll just delete this, click on yes. So we'll create a Perl file. So I'll click on new file. I'll save this as hello.pl. Click on save. And the only thing I'm going to return back from to the user is just the arguments that I have passed. So this is the only line that I will write here. So let's go back to a bootstrap. So now here is where the important task takes place. I'll go back to my bootstrap file here. And here, all I need to do is the first thing I need to do is I need to remove this source because I'm not going to extract it from the shell script. And the so here, the only change I need to make is that this particular response I should get from the Perl script that I have added in the layer. And I should add the name of the file as well as the event data. So let's do that. So I'll just remove this piece of line here. And what I've done here is I'm just calling the Perl binary. And I'm just the arguments that I'm giving is just the hello.pl. That is this particular file. And the event data is basically the same event data I get from here. And I'm just returning it back in the response. And then put this particular response will be sent back to the user. So let me save this here. So you can understand how easy that was. So there was just one line of change that I made here. So again, the hello.pl will just return the argument back to me. So I'll click on test now. So I need to give a name for my event. So I'll just call this as my event. And I'll click on create. And let's test this. So you can see that I got the same response that I had in my event. So I hope this was a useful lecture. If you have any issues with this, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. I'll gladly help you out. So I'll see you in the next chapter. So in this particular section, we'll talk about creating a function using blueprints. So I'll click on create function and I'll click on use blueprint. So here you get a basic set of sample code along with its configuration available for you to use. Unfortunately, at this moment in time, you only get it for Python and Node.js. So what I'll do is I'll create a Node application. So I'll just search for Node. And here you get a lot of choices. So if you want to have a simple mobile backend, you can just choose this particular option. Or if you want to have a node that will execute a child process, you can opt for this. So what I'll do is I'll just do a basic S3 connected to a node application. So I can just click on S3 get object and I will click on configure. So here I need to give a name for my function. So I'll just call this as my blueprint function. And I'll create a new role. So I just need to give a role name. So I'll just call this as my blueprint role. And I also need to choose a S3 bucket that will trigger this particular Lambda. So I will choose my code bucket. So this basically is also in Ohio. And that is important because I cannot choose a bucket from another region. So for all of object create event that's the event type that i'll choose and here you get that sample code that will be put into your function so i'll just click on create function here and that's it you have your function created and all that will display here is basically the content type so you can see the code here and you can see that your blueprint is created and it is automatically connected to an s3 bucket so all that i need to do is i will just go to my s3 So I will open my bucket here and I'll upload a folder or should I say I'll upload a file and let's make this as a CSS file and I'll click on upload. And if I go back to my blueprint, so if I look at my particular code, so I go to my code 
And what it should do is it should at least console.log to me the content type. So the content type here is a CSS. So let's go to our monitor and let's view logs in CloudWatch. And you can see that a stream got created. So if I open this, you can see that the content type here is CSS. So, so, so this is how you can use Blueprint. So it's very simple to use. So all that you need to do is just make a few configurations and you're up and ready with the function. So I will see you in the next chapter. So in this particular section, you will see how you can use a container to create your Lambda function. Now, why would you do that? The most important reason as to why you would do it is because your container image can be up to 10 GB in size as opposed to the 250 GMB if you are using a normal Lambda function. So if, you're, if you have an application which has a large workload, which relies on a lot of dependencies, such as machine learning or data intensive workloads, then if you want to run that as a Lambda function, then the only way that you can do it is if you run it as a container. So let's see how you can run a Lambda as a container. Okay, so let's create a container. And then that particular container we will upload to a registry and then we will use our Lambda to run that particular container. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to get our source code. And the source code is just going to be the same old source code that we had used previously. It's just an exports.handler and all that it returns is a hello world or should I say hello from Lambda back to the user. So this particular source code, we're gonna containerize it and then that particular container will be run within a Lambda. So let's see how that is done. So we have our app.js and we have our package.json. So what we need to do is we need to write a Docker file. And let me show you this particular Docker file. So that is the only thing that you need to do. And in this particular Docker file, I'm using a base image that is provided by AWS itself. So this is the base image that you would use if you want to run your Lambda as a container. And all that it does is it just copies the app.js and the package.json file to a particular path. So this particular path is an environmental variable that is provided by this base path. And it just points to slash where slash task. So once that is done, you can just do a run npm install and then you can run this app.handler. So this app.handler should point to the function that we need to run. So the app.js file should have this particular function named handler. And that is precisely what we have. So we have our app.js and within the app.js is the handler function. And all that it returns, like I said previously, is just the hello from Lambda. So the first thing that we will do is we will run this locally. And once we are sure that it runs locally, then we will upload it. And then we will use our Lambda to run this particular container. So let's run this locally first. So to run your, so to run this locally, first I will create a container image out of this. So it will be a Docker build. I will tag this as Lambda function. And then it will be the same path because this is where my Docker file is. So let's run this particular command. Okay, so my container image is created. Just to check, I can just do a Docker image ls. And you can see that my particular image has been created. So the next thing that I need to do is I need to run this locally. Now, okay, so now that my image is created, let me run my image. So to do that, I can call the Docker run command. And here I need to link the port IDs. So here the port ID 8080 is basically the container images port that is listening to my application. And that is connected to 90015. So 90015 is basically a random port number that I have chosen. And this is basically the local host port number. So whenever I need to access it, I need to use 9050, 9015 to access my particular application. So let's run this particular command. Okay, so now that my application is running in a container, how do I access it? Now, this certainly is not a web app, so I can't just do a localhost 9015 and access that particular application. So what makes it possible for me to access this particular function is something called as the runtime interface emulator. So when I use the AWS base image, that AWS base image ha had something called as a runtime interface emulator. And it is this particular runtime interface emulator that makes it possible for me to access that particular function. So all that I need to do is I just need to run this particular command to access it. Now to get more information about runtime interface emulator, you can just open this particular path and get more information. So this tells you what all can be done and how you can access your lambdas using a local image. So 
this is something that is a bit more complex and if you guys need any help with this i'll just certainly help you out so in the meantime all that i need to do is i just need to run this particular command to access this particular function that i had created so what i'll do is i will create another terminal here i'll use the powershell and i will just run that particular command so here the only thing so here the only thing that i need to change is i just need to use curl.exe else it does not work so let me just add this curl.exe and this and here the dash d is basically the event that i need to provide so here the event would be just an empty json nothing more so let's run this application and another thing to note is you need to provide the appropriate port number so this particular application is running on 15 90 15 so here you get the appropriate response. So this is basically the status code 200 and the body hello from Lambda. So this is this particular response and this was what I was expecting. So I hope this was useful. Now, now this particular container comes in handy if you want to run your applications locally before you upload them to AWS. So this is how you would do it. And this is something that should basically be an extension of my previous chapter in which I was uploading that source code into my Lambda directly as an zip file or as an s3 bucket so before i had done that i should have actually run this code locally and this is how you can do it so once again all that you need to do is you need to use a docker file and this docker file should be basically pointing to the base image that's provided by aws and this base image has something called as your runtime interface emulator and using this runtime interface emulator you can just run this curl command to access that particular function locally so I hope this was a useful lecture. If you have any issues with this particular lecture, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me and I'll definitely help you out. So I'll see you in the next lecture where this particular container image that you've created, we will upload it to a AWS registry and then we will create a Lambda using that particular image that we have in our registry to create a function out of it. So I will see you there. Okay, so now let's go back to our console. So you need to open the Amazon Elastic Container Registry and we need to upload our repository here so what we need to do is we need to click on create a repo so i'll click on start here and i need to give a name for my repo so i'll just call this as lambda function and let's create this repo so i'll click on create repo i'll open this and then what i need to do is i need to open this view push commands and I need to run these set of commands in my local. So the first thing I need to do is I need to log in. So to log in, I need to open this particular command. So I'll just copy this. I'll open my PowerShell. Okay, I'm logged in now. So let's run the next command. So I already have the build made, so I can just leave this function. So I've already created the build. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we need to build that image. So we've already built this image, so we can just leave this as it is. So this is not needed because we've already built it and we've tested it locally. So after that, you can just copy this particular command and let's just paste this. So I'll just run this. And after that is done, I can just click on this Docker push and so this will push it to the remote repository so let's just wait for this to finish <clears throat> okay so we push the container to our repository so let's go back to our console here so let's refresh this and you can see that the image has been uploaded. So let's go to a Lambda now. I'll click on Lambda. And all that I need to do is I need to create a new function. And this should be a container image. And all that I need to give is just the name for my function. So I'll just call this as function container. And I need to just browse for that image. Click on select and I'll create the function.
And let's test this particular function. So I can just click on test here. Just give a name for my event. I'll just call this as event. I'll click on save. Save changes. And let's click on test. And you can see that I get that same result that I was expecting. That is the status code 200 and body from Lambda. So this is basically this same code that we were expecting as the output. So that is how you can use your container to create a Lambda function. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. So I'll see you there.